Okay, fantastic. So, uh, just like yesterday, you have to actually turn the microphones on. So, uh, anyway, um, welcome, Vince Staley, uh, Executive Director of Media Impact Funders, and welcome to our Media Impact Forum, Remaking Public Media. Um, we're really happy to have you here with us today, uh, and some of you to have you back in this room. It looks very different from yesterday when we were uh, had a gathering of journalism funders in here, a different setup and a, a different dynamic. We hope you enjoy both of them if you were here before. And uh, please come right on in and take a seat. And uh, we, we, we really want to encourage people to sit up front and uh, uh, not lurk in the back too much. Um, we're going to be, uh, uh, we've got a great assembly, I think, of talent uh, up here and a, a very impressive group of uh, participants in the room as well. We want to make a, uh, this a dynamic set of presentations, but also a lively discussion as well. So we're going to try and uh, have fast-paced programs and, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of time for uh, dialogue with all of you here in the room. Um, this event uh, is on the heels of uh, several other events this week. We started, several of us, <coughs> at least um, Monday evening, um, with a, a, a dinner for journalism funders uh, discussing issues of press freedom. Uh, there's some very important issues uh, bubbling up in press freedom. Um, and then yesterday all day with uh, our journalism funders group. Um, and last evening, we were very fortunate to be able to uh, uh, unveil our inaugural Media Impact Festival, uh, awarding uh, two films and, and, and funders associated with them um, at uh, an event at the National Geographic. So some of you were with us at any of those events. Um, uh, th thank you for, for joining us uh, this week. And thanks especially to our friends at the National Geographic for hosting us there. It was really a, uh, a lovely evening and a great venue to, to, to celebrate media that makes an impact. And nobody does that better than the National Geographic, so thank you for that. And also thanks uh, f to our hosts here. David Rousseau is a, a member of the Board of Media Impact Funders and our host here uh, in Washington, the Kaiser Family Foundation's Barbara Jordan Conference Center. Um, it's been a really great couple days here in this incredible, uh, flexible, and uh, and highly technologically adept uh, uh, facility. We've got uh, great partners in presenting these programs this week. Um, so, excuse me, um, one thing I want to point out is uh, we, this is an open event. We've got a reporter from The Current uh, newspaper uh, here with us. Mike Jansen is with us, and we have several uh, stacks of, of that paper. It's a very important uh, record of uh, what's happening in public media, and so um, uh, be sure to read that and be in touch with Mike if you have something to say. Um, and we want all of you to, to write the first draft of this meeting with your cell phones or phablets or whatever you've got in your pocket. Um, you know, uh, tweet uh, as much as you can. Uh, Media Funders is our uh, handle and uh, our hashtag is MI Forum today. So to keep things rolling along very quickly uh, and to, to have as... Uh, uh, lively but profound a discussion all day long. Um, we were very happy to uh, to happen upon our MC for the day. Um, as soon as we saw the title, dir um, Director of uh, Vertical Initiatives and Mischief, uh, we knew that Matt Thompson was the right guy to lead us through our discussions today. And I'm going to ask him to come right up and uh, take us out. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Vince, and thanks to all of you. Good morning. Um, so, um, I, as Vince mentioned, I'm the Director of Vertical Initiatives and Mischief at NPR. Um, I have a few of my colleagues here today, so uh, Diane, if I say anything that's off-brand, just raise your hand and I'll instruct everyone not to tweet it, but otherwise, um, <laughs> As Vince mentioned, everything's on the record. Tweet away to the hashtag MIForum. Um, uh, when we talk, just to frame the day for you a little bit, um, typically when we talk about public media, we're talking about um, uh, very often the, the first image that comes to mind is the company that I work for, NPR, and PBS. 
Um, part of what we want to do today is we talk about remaking public media. What we want to do is stretch, broaden, expand um, your understanding of how we think about public media now. Um, my hope is that our first panel, um, approach our first panel with an open mind. We're going to be talking about games at the outset. Um, and think about games and their relationship to the work uh, that I do with teams of reporters and journalists at NPR uh, totally differently from the way that you've thought about what media means right now. Um, we're interested in the subjects of collaboration, how, um, how the media, one of the fundamental shifts that we've gone through as a society over the past couple of decades has been really rethinking the role of the public in media. Um, and what does public media mean at a moment when the public can be more involved than ever before? How do we engage the public uh, more in the media that we create and in the media that they make and consume? Um, we'll be exploring a wide variety of approaches and issues, how public traditional public media organizations and non-traditional outlets can work together to uh, create greater reach, to create greater sustainability, to collaborate more effectively, uh, and to do ultimately great storytelling, fantastic journalism. Um, we'll be asking questions like how Digital First fits into this, cr uh, crowdsourcing, interactivity in all of its different permutations, and of course, how all of you, how funders can approach this new universe and foment more collaboration, better sustainability, uh, and ultimately better media. So what do you expect from this day? Um, you, we have panels. Um, I know that many of you do not approach, approach the idea of a day of panels with some trepidation for good reason, as do I. It can be a real energy drain to have a day of panels. So hopefully we will keep the discussions themselves lively, build in lots of time for Q&A. So think of questions for yourself. Um, but there are only four panels today. The rest of our time together is time for you all to network with each other, uh, to engage, to meet folks, to talk about approaches to talk about what you've heard up here. There's going to be a games arcade that you can go investigate after our first session, actually play a little bit of what we talk about. Um, um, our hope is that you'll walk away from this day with new connections, with lots of knowledge about what's going on in the field, with a greater sense of the possibilities and opportunities for innovation, for funding, for sustainability. Um, there are four times for you to remember. Um, one of them we have already blown past, 9 a.m., <laughs> the start time of our first session. Um, but just remember, every two hours, 9, 11, 1, and 3, make your way back to these seats um, to begin the next panel. Um, and to that end, I have got two rules that I would like to foist upon all of you today. I would like to beg your, uh, your uh, acceptance of these two rules. So first of all, when I clap, and I'm gonna test this out right now, when I clap, I would like you to join me in applause. If you see me clapping at any point during the day, join me in applause. I'm not gonna clap yet. Um, this is in part as a signal to all of you who are out in the halls enjoying lively and wonderful conversations that will continue, but not as we start our panels. This, when you hear applause, this will be a signal that something amazing is happening in this room that you must turn back to. And so interrupt your conversation and begin applauding if you hear applause coming from this corner. So let's practice. All right, excellent. Rule number two, shuffle latecomers to the front. We'd like these, this, this glamorous row of five chairs is an example of what tends to happen in gatherings like these, and we want you all to be fully engaged with our panelists, so please come forward, occupy these seats, and uh, to shame anyone who does not heed the call of the applause, uh, please make sure to shuffle any latecomers to the front. <laughs> All right, so as we start, before we talk about digital games, let's talk about a game with digits. Let's actually play a little bit of a game um, to get this day kicked off. Um, you all might be familiar with uh, the game that is referenced here, Rock, Paper, Scissors. In case you are not familiar, let's go over the rules very quickly. 
Um, I would like you to find your neighbor, find a neighbor to participate in a best two out of three round of rock, paper, scissors with. Um, once again, I will say for each round, I will say rock, paper, scissors, shoot. And upon hearing the word shoot, make one of three shapes, a rock, a sheet of paper, or a pair of scissors. Um, once again, rock crushes scissors, scissors snips paper, and paper embraces rock. Yes, you might need to stand up for this, if you would. So to get us started with the game, have you all found your neighbors? I'll do it now, I'll do it here. All right, terrific. Ready, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh, wait, best two out of three. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh. Excellent. And who are our winners? Real quick, just raise your hands. Congratulations. All of you are superior. All right. Uh, that little technique um, uh, is something that our friends at the Stanford D School, the Hasso Plotner Institute of Design at Stanford, called a stoke, something that they do all throughout the day to raise the flagging energy of their participants. So I may, at any moment, without warning, in a panel, say, everyone stand, let us shoot. Um, so for our first session about digital games and learning, I mentioned this before, but really, when you think of games and learning, um, I think uh, Mavis Beacon's Typing Tutor might come to mind, or uh, the some sort of arcane counting game from elementary school. Put that out of your mind, because the stuff you're going to see this morning, I hope, will really expand your understanding of how games can influence learning and understanding. Um, before we get to the panel, I'm going to call up to the stage Jeff Curley, who at iCivics has helped develop the 20 educational games that iCivics has made, and will give a quick overview of what they've done. So Jeff, please join me. Share what you've done. Please welcome to the stage Jeff Curley. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Matt, Vince, and uh, Media Impact Funders. Excited to be here and talk very briefly about iCivics, um, which I think hopefully serves as a proof point for the possibility of games and game-based learning in schools. Um, and if there are skeptics in this audience, you should know that iCivics was founded by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who has embraced this medium as a very effective way to help students understand our system of government. So if we can get a Supreme Court justice on board, uh, hopefully we can push through any other skepticism there may be in the room. Um, iCivics, our goal, and I've lost my little clicker, sorry, is really to help students understand the relevance uh, and the, the system that we've set up here. As Justice O'Connor likes to say, this, this was one of the founding reasons that we got public schools in this country. The founders believed that uh, passing along our system of government was a, was a critical aspect of education. And when you poll students on civics, what you often hear is that it's a very dry, boring, and distant field for them. They don't understand the relevance to their lives. So we've used games as a way to really contextualize and situate the learning. Uh, because if you think about the structure of a game and the mechanic of a game, it's really, it's much like the system of government that we have. You have a set of hopefully motivating goals. Uh, you have an identity that you assume. It, the games allow students to really be goal-oriented and inquiry-based and explore from within. And they also have the added benefit of providing immediate feedback and hopefully personalizing around uh, the learning and aptitude of the student. They have an added benefit for teachers, and, and this is the audience that we largely uh, try to develop for, in that they can really be deployed with little preparation. Uh, they can help teachers 
convey concepts that may be difficult or, or, or challenging for students to really understand. Uh, so this is a picture of one of our schools in, in Waco Independent School District down in Texas that have adopted iCivics as uh, part of their curriculum and really have used our games to help students understand process and make sure that it's not, civics is not just about abstract facts and figures. So we've, we've had some success in the last four years of really achieving great scale. Uh, we design for the classroom experience and try to make things as easy as possible at, for our teachers to deploy. And our games have now been played in the last four years 23 million times by students around the country. That's in formal school and after school environments. Um, I was really shocked to find, we, we pulled the number of minutes last school year that students had played, and it was 5.9 million minutes of gameplay. So it's about 52 years worth of collective time that students spent learning civics through our games in one school year alone. And this has really helped us reach kind of nationwide impact at scale. We have teachers now uh, in all 50 states and in, in the district that are using iCivics, uh, 62,000 teachers are, are using, are, have adopted our curriculum annually. Uh, and that represents about half of all public U.S. middle school social studies teachers in the country. So I think it shows that this medium, if it's correctly deployed and you make it work for the teacher, can really get out and, and be in, uh, in scale around the country. Finally, I just want to, uh, finally, I think most importantly, say that um, games have been proven, our games have been proven to be very effective. Uh, and I know WNET is going to talk later today. They're another great group that has proven uh, this model. But we partner with uh, research universities around the country to really understand the impact of games. And what we've seen is not just increases in student understanding, knowledge, and skills transfer, but also motivational gains and literacy gains. Uh, one of the most exciting studies was actually done out of Tufts last year through a randomized control found that games helped increase significantly student literacy scores. So students were able to better understand how to deploy and, uh, and form an argument using some of our games. So I think there's added benefit beyond just an understanding of systems here. And uh, I'm incredibly excited to be, to be here just to talk a little bit about iCivics. As Matt said, we're gonna have an arcade upstairs. Uh, so please come play, explore, and, um, and join us upstairs later. We'll have a bunch of our games set up on uh, computer and mobile. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so let me welcome to the stage our three panelists for this first session. Um, first, uh, to my far uh, right, uh, let me ask Robert Torres to join us. So as the Senior Program Officer for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Robert leads the Foundation's Games for Learning strategy. Yes, right there, Robert. And um, uh, the competency-based education strategy uh, at the foundation, which he will tell you more about. Um, second, over here may introduce uh, Alan Gershenfeld, who as the president and founder of Eline Media is trying to help youth and young adults thrive in a very complex and rapidly changing world. And last, but of course not least, let me introduce Rob Lippincott, who as the operating partner for education and iCapital Group is trying to, trying to identify the most financially promising high social impacts in education education for gaming. Um, once again, to reiterate a couple points, after we have this panel, you will all be welcomed upstairs to the arcade to play some of these games for yourselves. Um, but secondly, um, as you think about what the panelists are talking about today, think about just how much tremendous mind share uh, games have accumulated in our society right now. Um, uh, our game makers have really, in some ways, mastered more than any other discipline the art of um, capturing attention, um, the mind-boggling amounts of attention, the 52 years of human attention that Jeff just described. Um, that is rippling out all through our society. There is n nothing um, quite as addictive as a great game. Um, and so there are, for there are forces using that attention share for evil. And these are some of the folks who I think are trying to use that for good. So, uh, um, so 
uh, Vince just mentioned we lost our timekeeper, so I am going to keep you all on a <laughs> pretty tight. We'll try to keep the presentations um, pretty quick. But let's start first with Robert. Um, and you're, if I may ask you to pass this along to Aaron. Sure. Yeah. Shall I begin? Yes. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Oh, I think I have to turn myself on. Okay. Turn your mic on yes. and, and you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I believe I have the enviable job of um, thinking about games and funding um, games um, for learning um, at the Gates Foundation. And I went there to do that job. Um, so, um, and, it's a, and it's a position that has remained um, for the last four years. I've been there f um, for the last four years. And I think we're going to continue to do it um, because the results, um, some of which I'll talk about today, um, have been pretty promising. So I'm going to give you um, a little bit of a history of my life and also a history of, um, of games um, in five minutes or less. Um, so um, uh, I wound up in this space um, uh, because um, I had been, I, I've done a lot of work in education. I was president of Teach for America's national faculty. Um, and while I was doing that, I made this film where I followed my family for five years um, for HBO. I grew up really poor um, on welfare. Um, and I went to a fancy school, and no one knew about poverty. Um, so I was like, what am I going to do with my family? Um, because I, I can't be their social worker. How about if we make a movie and reflect on the system of poverty? Um, and so system was used so many times by Jeff, right? I think that is, that is if, if there's a word that um, we um, might, might resonate, at, at least in my talk and maybe throughout the day, is that games are just that, a system of learning. And so I've been fascinated by that notion. I then went on to uh, do a school, uh, run a consulting firm that um, designed 30 schools in New York. Um, and no matter what the innovation, um, the assessment regime toppled the, the innovation, right? So, um, so that there's something that, about that, that issue that I wanted to tackle. Um, and so eventually went to um, back to school and said I could um, remain happily ever middle class and do education reform or maybe get into games and start to look at what kids were doing for a change. Um, and so um, I put this slide up just to give us, because we shouldn't forget, I mean, I think everyone in this room probably knows these numbers, but they're stark and, um, and this is the landscape we're working with. Um, with 95% uh, of kids in the eighth grade telling us that they want to go to college and then 8% um, of kids in the lowest um, SES uh, quartile graduating. Um, and irrelevant cited as, the, um, as a major factor um, in their dropping out. Um, this is what happens um, daily. Um, and I put, again, system, right? So systems are, you know, they're, they're, they're just systems all yield a, a result. Um, that's just what they do. And so we have a system that yields this one. Um, and we have the option of designing different ones. So this, is, this backdrop is also happening, right? So um, thanks to the Kaiser Foundation, um, in aggregate, um, kids are spending that much time daily um, in uh, engaged in media. 57% um, 50, of kids are internet content creators. Um, and uh, kids in the lower socioeconomic brackets are actually creating more content, which is interesting. And then that number. Um, and so, um, I went and got a, a dissertation, a, a PhD in the learning sciences. Um, and here, quickly, um, I discovered that the work that we've been talking about in the learning sciences for 40 years about mastery and, and how learning happens, um, ha happens to be, uh, happened to be the things that game designers were doing, right? How, wh how do you actually set up the conditions um, where people um, move through um, adversity and challenges and remain, right, and want to tackle tasks. So um, it, it, games have become for us um, a convenient solution. Um, so, so and, and that's something I want to stress because there's a frivolity that comes with the word game. I sometimes feel like, gosh, maybe it's the wrong word. It's a pedagogical tool that allows us to create a, a certain set of conditions where people are doing some remarkable things, and you'll see. 
Um, you know, so here are a bunch of principles, and um, the, 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 the book that really lists them super well um, um, from the learning sciences is Jim's, Jim G's book on what uh, video game substitutions about learning and literacy, and I would get that book in 2003, which led the MacArthur Foundation in 2006 to put down $50 million to launch a field of games learning. Um, and so, I, by the way, I'm happy to share these slides um, So afterwards, because there's more content than I can talk about. But I wanted to yell and sort of scream out these um, principles that have come out of both the learning sciences and the games research work. The issue of um, that we learn through learning ecology so that we so that a game like World of Warcraft becomes a generator node, right? We have a game um, that's that sits on its own and then this whole ecology has formed around um, it so that we actually learn through moving through if you if you if you're going to be a masterful architect you cannot just learn and do architecture in one place. You're actually doing it in many different ways, in many um, different contexts, over and over. So there's a lot of redundancy and repetition. And so games do that for us. Um, this, the, the notion of trial and error, right? So, duh, might we do that for kids. Um, there is so much work in games around identity development. You take on the role of something, that, you know, the, the, of an investigator, and relevance. You know something that, that that you know maybe we should have been considering for the last 100 years. Um, so um, a field quickly evolving. So the 1980s, Seymour Papert, at MIT, the the field emerges really then. Some argue that it came before, but in terms of real activity, 2000s, um, uh, MacArthur Foundation, Connie Yowell, DARPA, um, and and then now. And so sometime in 2005, six, we thought, gosh, you know. Be, with big data and data analytics, we, um, uh, we realized that it's not just that games are good for learning, but in fact that games are interesting assessment tools. And so my strategy has been particularly around that um, work. Um, and so um, I'll tell you um, a bit about the five design requirements that um, I require, but um, one, someone in our notes and said, you know, you should talk about how um, we don't we try not to fund one point, so, you know, single point solutions, but think about how do we catalyze a market. Um, and so we do challenges. So we, you know, throw out big challenges, and uh, you know, other foundations um, and groups do that. But the the things that we ask for is this issue of application. Are you asking kids to apply algebra to solve an engineering problem, a domain-based problem? Um, can they can they actually uh, do that, and, and can they show evidence? Can we assess complex skills, engagement, um, uh, <laughs> um, immediate feedback? You know, again, the issue of child labor um, and getting immediate feedback and data analytics, very granular, unlike any other technology available in which with, with, that humans interact with, games can do that. And so, I wanted to talk about, give you at least one example. I have about thirty examples I can give you. I chose this one. Many of you may have heard of this one where um, a, this is a collaboration between biochemists um, and just uh, a show of hands, fold it. How many people have heard? Good. So, like a third. So, that's good. So, um, because that, that, this is exciting. Um, so, for 15 years, scientists couldn't solve this problem of solving the, the protein structure of an enzyme that causes HIV in 10 days. Kids uh, solve it. Um, is it ten days? So, uh, three weeks. In three weeks, they solve it, um, and um, and which caused this whole um, uh, <coughs> revolution in um, pharmaceuticals and new and new medicines for. Um, and so, what I want to say about this is that it's an adaptive engine where we can, with you have you, with no biochemistry experience, with zero biochemistry experience. We can create a novice to expert trajectory, um, adapt it so that when whatever you need at a certain moment, um, you get right it, relative to the to the skill development. Um, and there are 17 skills uh, re uh, related to uh, protein folding, and that this engine then we've taken and done other things. Um, and so Dragon Box, um, this is a, a game for the iPad, which is very linear and beautiful. Um, we've pulled it and we've 
taken the Swedish French team um, and um, brought them to the U.S. Um, and were running statewide competitions and children beginning in the age uh, at, in kindergarten are learning algebra in an hour and a half. So they are not just learning algebra, but solving um, uh, linear equations um, in an hour and a half. There's much written about this, but um, these are the kinds of um, uh, conditions that we can create in games um, where pretty remarkable things are happening. Um, and um, I'm just going to, this last point about uh, uh, where the research is. Um, about a year ago, you know, we, this, this project has been a hypothesis, right? We really have been saying maybe this is a good idea. Um, and so we, I commissioned a meta-analysis. Um, my career could have ended um, after this, um, and, uh, or 10 years of work. Um, but it so happens that when um, we looked at 62,000 studies, um, 77 met the gold standard, and um, kids um, who um, could ha would have used games would have scored uh, 12 uh, points higher um, than kids um, who um, didn't. Um, and so that study is available on the SRI uh, website. Um, and that was a year ago. This year, uh, in about a week, um, at <coughs> June is the games month. Um, uh, we're going to get um, more granular into which features actually um, cause these gains. Um, and with that, I will leave us with Marshall McLuhan. Um, anyone who tries to make a distinction between education and entertainment doesn't know the first thing about either. <laughs> um, and be playful. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Robert. Well done. Well done. Actually, <clears throat> practice. Um, Alan. Thank you. This, yeah. This might give our folks a, no. a second to pull up our, pull up your okay, slides. Way. Way oh, I'm going too fast. Yeah. Way <laughs> there you go. Forward. We ready? Almost. I Almost. think you'll see your first slide show up there. The anticipation. Like I said, sing the Jeopardy theme song or something. Right. Like that. <laughs> and we, can, we can share any of these slides. Uh, yes. Absolutely. Another round of rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, when we teach game design, we have kids mod rock, rock paper, scissors. Because the rock, paper, scissors gets boring after, you know, three, four rounds. So we have kids conceptually think about how do you change the game yeah. so you'd want to replay it. It's a very interesting design exercise. You want to go full screen? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk fast, go through a lot of slides, hit the top of waves on some big points, and then hopefully foster conversation. So both Robert and Jeff you know, talked about the unbelievable amount of time kids spend games. I used to run the studios at Activision, a large commercial game company. Our games were played unbelievable amount of hours, many, 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 many years of gameplay. Um, but there's this amazing research that's coming around in terms of games and game-infused experiences for learning, for health, social impact that have evolved over the last 10 years. So this fascinating mix. We started, myself and a business partner started originally as investors. We wanted to invest in digital media, games, comics, largely games that could empower youth and young adults. We tracked hundreds, literally hundreds of millions of dollars around the world coming from foundations, government agencies, all sorts of public philanthropic academic funders. Uh, looked at a couple hundred projects and what we saw was very promising research, very promising pilots, but a huge gap in, term of, in terms of sustainable products and services. In the consumer space, I, I believe public media and in general philanthropy has not been successful with tweens teens and young adults. A lot more success with younger kids and adults. There's a big gap there. And that's when you know, youth are making their own decisions. We at Activision have a lot more of their mind share. In the educational space, fundamentally, time and money was not being replaced in the classroom. Increasingly, really strong projects are emerging from Robert's portfolio, from iCivics, which is exciting. But it's still a, it tends to be a little bit on the fringes, including our products, of the core subjects. And often, they're philanthropically supported as services. And, and when the philanthropic money runs out, it's very difficult to sustain because these are complex, multi-stakeholder teams that have to run these. So fundamentally, we saw this huge gap. We switched from an investment thesis to a publishing thesis to try to build repeatable, scalable mechanisms 
to take the best research out there and build sustainable solutions that were must-haves, not nice-to-haves in the consumer and educational space. As, as we, and I don't come from education, nor does my business partner, but our initial pro two products are in over 10,000 schools with no sales and marketing, focused on bottoms up teacher discoverability, reducing friction for teacher adoption, teacher to teacher recommendation. And it's put us in a position to have a terrarium to really look at what's going on. This is global, by the way, not just the US. And I, I have come out to believe that we have a once in a generation opportunity to actually transform how learning happens. And I'll, I'll deconstruct that just a little bit. There are a couple things that are happening that are unprecedented. Textbooks really are going away. What does that mean? That means curriculum is becoming unbundled. What does that mean? How will curriculum become rebundled is an amazing question so that they have a learning spine and sequence that is research-based, that genuinely empowers kids and covers the necessary content. All the assessments are changing. And they're changing in general in a good way. They're going towards more process, more application, more higher order skills. They're thinking about uh, 21st century skills, social emotional learning, applying skills. This is all good. Publishing is changing. You can now disintermediate broken top down channels and go directly to teachers. That's how we got into 10,000 schools. That's largely how iCivics got to such wonderful scale quickly, going right to teachers. New platforms are emerging. So technology is now in the classroom and it's going to be messy. You're going to have iOS devices, Android devices, computer labs, and it's going to keep changing. It's going to be complex. The world is changing. You know, employers are telling you all over the world, our employees are not problem solvers. They're not effective collaborators. There's these literacies that we need that will change regardless of the domain context. So massive changes are happening. In general, I believe that, be that leads to inquiry-based blended learning as a solution. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that more. In the consumer side, any of you with kids know that it's a struggle to, to deal with the amount of time, 8, 9, 10, 11 hours a day on digital media. That is scary for a parent. I, I'm in the business, and it is scary for me. Uh, struggling with the content, even understanding, are these games good? Are they bad? What's going on? Parents are struggling. Kids are actually struggling. And yet, you have the same dis disintermediation. A game like Minecraft, which if anyone has a kid between the age of 8 and 14, you know Minecraft. One guy created that game and 40 million kids are obsessed with it. That couldn't have happened when I was running the studios at Activision because we controlled retail, Walmart, Best Buy. It's all changing. Unbelievable opportunity in education consumer. I have come to believe that not a game, a bounded game where you play and finish, an adventure game, a strategy game. You can do good work with a bounded game, but it's going to be relatively narrow. But a game-infused framework, a game-infused system that can create a, a highly engaging spine where kids can <coughs> take on identities, fail safely, go on personalized trajectories, but with many modalities building it out. Uh, best of practice modalities that can be adapted, extended locally by teachers, by schools, I believe is where things are going. It's not going to be a single algorithm that solves education. It's not going to be an app store. It's going to be something in, in the middle. And I think our community of practice with, with the projects that you, you know, just got a taste of is actually starting to see real traction. This is, this is kind of what we distilled down to, and I'll just let you sort of absorb it. But I do think it starts with an aspirational vision. I think th this work is hard. People have to really believe in it, and not just the makers of the content, the teachers, the administrators, the parents. Folks have to be pulling for it to be successful, whether in consumer education. And I can give some examples in the discussion of where I believe aspirational visions are taking hold. It's, it's going to be not a game, but a game-infused, inquiry-blended process with multiple modalities. And a modality could be a video lecture, it could be a project-based activity, it could be a smart tool that you use in the game, in the real world, multiple modalities. It's not going to be one company or one product. It's got to be extended, adapted, and continually optimized by a community of practice just to cover all the content and needs that are out there. It has to be a service that's rigor rigorously optimized on quantitative and qualitative data. And ultimately, it has to fill a market need. It needs to be a must have, not a nice to have. Otherwise, the philanthropic funding will run out and the project will die. We've seen it too much. Ultimately, it'll be multi-stakeholder partnerships. And we, as the stakeholders, are going to have to have all the dispositions, literacies, and skills that we want to foster in our youth, because this is hard. This, so e these are some of our partners. Um, it's been fascinating. And we have more. It's why I have a lot of gray hair. But I can, tell you, I can tell you that the high-risk philanthropic public interest and academic dollars have been critical to our company because this is hard. We've had to learn the learning science. We've had to learn this stuff. We are now at the cusp of a transition where we do believe 
we, we, we can find the market traction, find the revenue in an impact appropriate way, and still use the high risk dollars when we have to explore new areas that we're just not sure about and we need more research and learning. We, as I mentioned, we do believe in 24-7. We have big movements around games and cultural storytelling, keeping cultures alive, games in the brain for youth, which is a very sensitive subject, civic engagement. On the educational side, we're doing cross-curricular, initially middle school, then we're gonna go high school, college, and post-secondary, really thinking about cultivating dispositions, mentoring literacies, and covering domain knowledge. One product example uh, started, actually Robert wrote his PhD on this, uh, James G, Katie Salen, two of the best game-based learning researchers did the kind of learning science behind it. And it's a middle school curriculum to teach kids to design games, to foster design thinking, systems thinking, 21st century skills, motivation for STEM. But it's not a, a game. There is a bounded game where you play and fix broken games in an adventure context. It also has a tool where you can design games. We've had over a half a million youth created games played 15 million times in 100 countries. There's a safe community where you learn to be a digital citizen. You can review, comment on games, a very flexible curriculum so it can be two weeks or a whole year. It can be a learning service. We have quantitative and qualitative assessment. We run competitions. I believe that this is a, a picture from a week ago at the White House. I believe it's the first picture of a sitting, actually squatting, US president playing a video game. And it's one of our National STEM Challenge winners who was invited to the White House Science Fair, an amazing game that this kid created. The president's struggling a little bit there with the first level. <laughs> On the consumer side, we have a joint venture with an Alaska Native tribal organization where we did a survey of how um, indigenous and underrepresented cultures were in, uh, represented across media. A lot of wonderful films, Whale Rider, Fast Runner, wonderful films, comics, Persopolis, gra graphic novels, nothing in video games. In fact, it was horrific the representation of underrepresented cultures. And so we did a joint venture with a wonderful pioneering Alaska Native tribal organization called the Cook Inlet Tribal Council to really urge into existence great game makers working with elders and storytellers to bring stories that have been around for thousands of years in languages that have been around for thousands of years to a global audience. And I'll show a quick 30 second trailer and that'll be the end of my presentation. So this game is gonna come out uh, in November and it was a two-year trust-building process between game makers and elders. So we, we can stop. I, I just want to give you a little taste of it. Instead of gold coins that you unlock, you'll actually unlock stories by the elders that we have film crews that are very, very powerful that inspired the game. Uh, the, the arc of the story is actually a story that's been around for thousands of years about an endless blizzard. We experienced that on the East Coast this year. Um, and the young girl, it's all about interdependence between the girl and the fox, which is an incarnate, um, the, the girl, the fox, and nature, and the real and the spiritual. Um, and if you're interested afterwards, you can go to neveralonegame.com and see the whole trailer. Um, so that's just a quick overview. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> and you're up. Thank you, Matt. Um, well, as usual, I'm following Alan. Um, <laughs> uh, and if, if you follow him over the next, next month, well, actually probably starting last week at the White House, you'll see that uh, it's, it's quite an interesting trail this idea is going. I want to speak very briefly about the, what I see the, as the implications of games. Many of my points have already been better made. Um, the, the vision I think that we all as educators have had, my history is as an educator. I started as a teacher. I worked in educational media, just was finished a stint of seven years at PBS very recently. Worked at Discovery and Pearson, a bunch of other of the major uh, education publishers. <clears throat> is that in fact, as Alan said, tech, textbooks are going away, finally, truly. And in, in fact, it is about technology-infused learning. And the vision is really that we need a whole system, that we need a fully instrumented digital platform that is fundamentally, but fundamental to that is engaging content. And that's one of my three key words. One is engaging, the other is measurement, 
and the last is results. And that's the reason why I think games are such an incredibly powerful place for us to look for investments. Investments of our time, investments of our kids' time, investments uh, in the financial world as well. I think this will liberate teachers, by the way. I don't think teachers should be afraid of games or technology. I think they will be empowered. Um, Robert and, and Alan especially talked a lot about what I have been calling the tectonic forces. Uh, there are changes in the standards and assessments. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about Common Core. It's a beautiful restructuring and a better way to think about the three R's. There's been a little bit of talk about the four C's, the creativity, critical thinking, communication, uh, and uh, collaboration. The, they're not 21st century skills. They're first century skills, but they need 21st century media to do them. We're really talking about deeper learning. It's really what teachers have always talked about. And in fact, the question now is can we measure, can we build creativity and grit and, and the rest? The data, which is the really important byproduct of gaming, uh, and it, it's a byproduct of gaming which suddenly becomes the core reason why gaming is so important in education, is because it is embedded adaptive assessment. Games are embedded assessment. They are telling you all the time where you are, how far you've come, how far you need to go, giving you hints. Uh, and it's all about feedback instead of what is in too often the case in current assessment, much more like an autopsy. Here's what happened last year. Uh, and it's really about trying to get to the, what all teachers know every child needs, which is personalized learning. Each child needs their own path through this knowledge and their own way to construct that path. The one thing I would uh, mention that hasn't been mentioned is, I think, the work of Carol Dweck in something called the growth mindset. A big, simple truth, and that is that you can grow smarter. You can make yourself, you can train yourself to be smarter. You can learn all kinds of things. It is not like you're born with a certain IQ and you're stuck there, or that you are smart, or that you are not smart. And in fact, that's a really important, profound, and obvious to kids who play games. A gamification is a word that often people think of as, as having cheapened education in some way. But Merriam-Webster, uh, I think, has a wonderful definition, which is it's turning students into continual learners. This little girl, of course, is learning by playing a game. It's about super why it's one of the ones that we built at PBS Kids. And she's doing it in between things, literally in between the seats, but in between lessons or on the way to, to school or from school. It's, it's where kids learn is exactly where they want to because it's in a digital world. <clears throat> and it's engagement. Uh, a sixth grader last week before the Senate said, why do you, when, when asked why do you like games, he says it's connected to things I like to do, like saving people from earthquakes. It's powerfully empathically engaging. It's, it's important instead of boring, which is what the rest of school is really all about uh, all too often. Uh, embedded assessment, Robert mentioned uh, Folded. And the guys who have done Folded are, have moved into the, the process of creating a platform. They did a test last month. And in, the May, in May, they found that kids who were using this adaptive platform to learn math Kids who were using the paper version of the very same curriculum and the digital version, the kids using the digital version simply solved five times as many problems. They were incented and empowered and allowed, and they went ahead and did five times as many problems because they wanted to, because it was more exciting. That's the kind of thing that I think teachers are going to be really thrilled about, and it's why, it's why this is a, an important social good and what the social impact of gaming really is about. That's great, but what's the financial impact? And how do we create some sustainability? What is the through line? Public media is in the process of becoming, instead of public broadcasting, really public broadband. Uh, because it really is not going to stop broadcasting, not going to stop making video. In fact, one of the coolest sentences I found in my research for this is one from a report on EdSurge said, one great video from the PBS Idea Channel on YouTube recently asked the question, is Minecraft the ultimate educational tool? <clears throat> Sort of parsing that sentence shows where we are in the public media world. The public media channel on YouTube, a, a program that's a piece of video that is short and digital, that's really interesting. And of course, it's happening to us. We, can, we know that in public media. But we are trying to figure out, and what we need to focus on is how to capture that engagement that we find, and we've been talking about in terms of ga games, how to measure the progress, and so that we can talk about results. Because in the finance world, it's all about results. It's all about what is the impact socially. That's interesting. But it's not as important as what the impact is financially. There has to be a return. 
And of course, we need to create a financial stack, which does not cut out the millions, in fact, hundreds of millions of dollars that the government is putting into this, or the millions because they're really precious millions, sometimes all too few in the philanthropic world, but those that are at very high risk. And we need to back those up with new venture-backed uh, investment from uh, investors. We need people to feel safe that they can put their money into education, instead of thinking of education marketplace as an oxymoron, which is what traditional venture capitalists have always done. So we're, in, we're at I2 looking at things like social impact bonds and pay, the pay for success model or venture debt, things that allow us to enter a financial stack with all of the other traditional funders, but offer financial return in somehow a safe investment for uh, private investors. Because there are hundreds of millions of dollars waiting to be deployed in education. People are eager to get involved in this. And what we need as a public media community is to show them why that makes sense, and in fact, how it makes a few dollars. It doesn't have to make all the money that a regular investment makes. It just needs to make money. And I think that's the fundamental mind shift that will, that will empower the entire private investment community to back it. And I think that one of the reasons why I'm so excited about games is, why, is what we've been talking about. And that is the, the incentives are there. The incentives are for kids to learn, the incentive for parents to buy, the incentive for uh, people to invest. <clears throat> Thank you very much. What? Thanks to all three of our panelists. Um, man, you all preceded me that time. So <laughs> I'm going to cede moderator's prerogative to ask any questions of my own because I'm sure your questions will be much, much better. We've got runners at either end of the room, I believe, with microphones. Um, they can answer your questions. So throw your hands up and I will call you out. All right, sir. Whoa, I thought you, okay. Quick question, um, David Haas, Wincode Foundation. Uh, critical thinking, problem solving games. Can you give me an example of uh, writing uh, authorship uh, versus cutting and pasting uh, in terms of writing, uh, there's a lot of visual, there's a lot of uh, math, structural. Are there games that are having this impact on the ability to write and, and conceptually? I'm, I'm assuming there are, but I'm curious what you're seeing. Well, we just released, um, so we just released um, a game for the iPad about two weeks ago. Um, so one of the largest projects we have is a lab at EA, at Electronic Arts. Um, it's called Glass Lab, um, and it's a collaboration be between some of the country's best uh, game designers and the best psychometricians um, uh, to embed um, uh, validated measures into the games, right? So, I mean, uh, uh, like I said, uh, uh, my personal uh, quest um, in life uh, and, and the game that I'm going to play in my life is how to get rid of chess. So, um, it, it, and, and this is part of that. How do we um, really create environments in which we can um, a, a get better information about what kids know? And so Arcobot um, just launched and it's an argumentation game. So it's for, uh, to, to, um, show that you can construct um, and write um, an argument and be assessed in doing so. And it's, it's on the iPad right now. I, just to add on that, I, I am very frustrated with the writing I see in my kids, in our employees that we hire. <coughs> so I, I think it's a very interesting question. And, and writing takes a lot of practice, a lot of grit, a lot of discipline, a lot of iteration. Teachers constantly tell us they struggle with the size of their class and the amount of just reading and grading. Um, kids are not often motivated to write and rewrite. So I, I do think it's a systemic set of things that need to be um, put in place to make writing interesting to kids so that they want to do it, have the grit to see it through and want to see it through. Teachers, uh, parents, writer's room coaches having the ability to provide effective, efficient uh, feedback. There are process solutions, there are technology solutions. At ASU, we're working on game-based teacher professional development with Intel, where we're actually helping writer's room workshop give efficient feedback, looking for tools to make it easier. It's, it's a complex question that I think is critical that there is not one game that will solve. That's right. Can I just add, so, there, so this, but your work, um, it, it, in terms of creating these um, pathways, so there is not one technology that will solve um, all of you, right? Like there's impossible that one game will teach you, but this uh, idea where you create these pathways that are populated 
Um, the, 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 the pathway itself is game infused. Um, it's structured on missions and quests, populated by various assets. Um, is a way to create sort of this ecology um, that you know you're saying is necessary. Who else? Over here. And if I could ask you to stand too. Yeah, and please stay. We're film, uh, recording. Yeah. So I'm Adrienne Furness from the Benton Foundation, and I wanted to just talk a little bit about something that Robert mentioned very briefly, which is called the E-Rate, which is a government uh, program that is trying to bring faster uh, speeds and, and more broadband to schools and libraries, to anchor institutions. And we're at a very critical point right now because uh, the program is trying to be modernized and have the amount of money spent on this to be expanded. Um, Connie Yell once told me that she can't do what she wants to do in schools without faster speeds and more bandwidth. Uh, particularly in vulnerable communities, um, uh, uh, rural, rural areas, et cetera. So I just want to say that uh, sort of what you can't really do what you guys want to do in schools without the uh, broadband speeds and connections that you need. And it's something that a lot of people in this room should be thinking about. Thank you for that comment. So we have time for two, three, if we go fast, questions. Who else? Over here, Peggy. Hi, I'm Peggy Gershman from the, I started to say National Science Foundation, no, <laughs> Kaiser <laughs> Health News. And um, I, I was struck by the 62,000 studies, 70 met the gold standard. Yeah. So I'm wondering what that means in terms of uh, how much money and time is being spent on studies that maybe aren't necessarily so excellent. So I wondered about that. Big problem. Yeah. I mean, <coughs> um, I mean, the, I mean, it's uh, the bigger problem is um, holding um, that standard, right? So if we problematize the standard itself, um, which is a pharmaceutical standard, uh, right, and and um, and not use other more agile st standards that are less expensive and that um, actually give us so that it. Um, but to when you know if you're going to do a meta-analysis and you want it to have credibility, you've got to use that approach. So, but it's a great point that so few of the 62,000 actually did the um, you know randomized control trials. Um, yeah. But but the reality is, and having done many studies, funded many studies at PBS, it takes two years and a lot of effort and a very careful. Uh, treatment control, gold standard, and a, a huge amount of the money which otherwise you want to put on the screen. Uh, and when you're done, you're actually talking about something that's probably way out of date. And you're not even sure whether the lessons are as applicable because the technology has changed. And in fact, you changed the whole game. It's now three, four generations or the entire television program. Uh, because that the time scales are so out of whack. For us to sort of scratch our heads at gold standard level, is a very difficult way to measure whether something works. We've got to get to the point where not only much more agile methodologies, but a lot more immediate understanding and acceptance, yeah. actually the way the market does. Yeah, so you mentioned NSF. We, we just got some funding from NSF to do something that we're calling impact-based research, which is to address this specific challenge, which is how do we create dynamic, observable indicators and actionable feedback around learning goals that continue over time where stakeholders have a window into it, the, the makers of the software, the teachers, the students, the parents, but also the researchers, mm -hmm. and, and looking at snapshots along the way to meet each of their needs, but in a continual dynamic way. And you know, as Rob mentioned, that is what industry does very effectively. We're trying to bring people from industry to look at those best practices, bring researchers, and find how to make um, assessment sort of dynamic living and not static snapshots. One last question. Jessica? Bring it back around. I was wondering if you could. Uh, <laughs> Anybody Jessica? give you a microphone to even also? Yes. <laughs> Jessica from Medium Impact Funders. Uh, just bring it back around. So if you could tell the funders in the room, how can they fund games better? What, you know, give it to us in a sentence. What, 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 do, we, what do they need to know? A sentence. What, do, what would you want all of these folks to take away from here in one sentence? <laughs> I'll bring back the Jeopardy theme song, maybe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 right. Right. 
Well, I mean, certainly there is a dearth in the writing space. So I give you one example. We've got a lot of technology, uh, games and, and otherwise, in the math space. So that is uh, an area that is uh, just a, a void. Um, and I would, uh, design, I would fund in a way that is uh, elevating the um, importance of the pedagogical conditions that the games create versus the bells and whistles. I, I would say look at some of the major pain points that are out there. Align that with an aspirational vision that your foundation is passionate about and figure out from the beginning what sustainable and uh, scalable solutions and ecosystems look like and build the partnerships, public, private, industry to get there. I, I think that the idea of starting from the beginning with an eye on the results, I think that's what your funding will most effectively buy. And in, fa in fact, I think it will help the people whose project you're funding. It's not just prove this as a, an interesting idea, which is a very important and precious thing that a lot of philanthropy does. But if you can actually pull through a result rather than push through an idea, I think that's a really critical way of thinking about it. And if I could sum up what we've said in one sentence, I would say we have to eliminate the perception that educational games and recreational games live in different marketplaces. If our mm -hmm. educational games aren't as fun as Minecraft, students right. won't play and students won't learn. Um, let me bring up to the stage Sandra Shepard from WNET, um, who will sh share um, uh, one example of a game that you'll also be able to um, explore further in our arcade very briefly. Thank you, Sandra. Great. Well, thank you. I might just borrow the clipper Absolutely. back. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, Vince, um, for inviting us. And I think my first task when I go back to WNET is to change my title, because I like Matt's title <laughs> better than mine. Mischief um, for all. Mischief yeah. for all. Um, anyway, I'm delighted to be here. And we're going to showcase um, upstairs in the games uh, arcade a couple of examples of digital games that are really serving as powerful learning tools. And I just want to um, mention that there are a couple of principles that guide us at WNET. UNET as we develop our work. First and foremost um, is education and engagement because um, they certainly go hand in hand. Collaboration. In the public media space, we cannot do it alone. We have to go outside and find partners to work with. Um, one other note, which is smart experimentation. Um, I think we have to keep pushing ourselves to innovate. And then finally, impact. Um, you know, that's what we're about in public media, broad and diverse impact. Um, so we have been developing some games um, that are on all different platforms and not only reach the youngest of children, as Alan mentioned, but we're really trying to look to that gap in the tweet space. And upstairs, I'm going to showcase a game that actually touches upon that. Um, I think when you think about content, yes, um, we do develop games in mathematics. Uh, we've touched upon algebra. But we're also developing games in language learning, uh, in health. Uh, and in history. Um, and I think one of the aspects um, about our approach to games that is, um, it's, it's not unique, but I think it's important to underline is that we set our games in rich story worlds, and we have compelling characters that are relatable um, to kids. And we do apply a fairly iterative and research-based approach to our development, which does take time um, and certainly um, support. But I think at the end of the day, you get quality from that. Um, so just briefly, um, when you join us upstairs, which I hope you will, um, we're going to highlight one game that's actually for the tween market, Mission US. And this game combines scholarship with role play. And it actually allows players um, to step into the shoes of somebody from the past. Um, we've had over 700,000 ongoing registered players with 30,000 teachers in all 50 states. And I really like to say that um, Mission US is, is a model of um, really public engagement uh, in the humanities space. And I think one thing that's interesting um, is there is no broadcast component. This is a digital 
uh, gaming project first and foremost, but our public uh, media colleagues and communities have embraced it. Um, and then I do want to touch upon a game in the math space that really showcases our um, urge to innovate. Um, we've developed um, so some augmented reality apps um, for a uh, project called CyberChase, which is a long-running and successful math series uh, funded by the National Science Foundation and many others. And what's interesting is that this app, this educational app, in its first week became the number one free app on iTunes. So um, we as the panel embrace education and we see that kids do as well. So um, thank you so much and please join us upstairs. Thank you, Sandra. And please join me in thanking our three panelists. Mm -hmm. uh, really do take a look at these games. If I have a goal for all of you for the next 45 minutes, it's that you find a game that you become obsessed with. Um, mm -hmm. Alan shared a very brief glimpse of Never Alone, but that really has gone viral all over the internet there, mm -hmm. folks. Really looking forward to that game when it comes out in the fall. So you get a chance to go and check it out. I encourage you to do so, to network with one another, and remember that we will be back here for another lively session at mm -hmm. 11. <laughs> Yeah. Next, um, next is LA. Next is LA. Let's let's. Oh, I have to turn myself off.